Uh, I wrote this talk last night and timed it on the way over, and it was considerably over time, so I'm going to have to talk very, very quickly. Um, what is the talk about? It's about immersion. Um, I want to talk briefly about what I think immersion is. I don't want to get too bogged down in, in semantics. I want to talk about why do we want to achieve immersion in LRP. I want to talk about what causes it. And when I've gone through that, I want to get to the real meat of the talk, which is about how do we get it? How do we create immersion in our LARP games? And how do we make more immersive LARP games? What the talk is not about, I'm not going to talk about Empire. I appreciate that will be slightly disappointing to some people. Um, we, the, what, the ideas that I'm talking about do underpin Empire, and they're really going into the, kind of the theory and the design of Empire, but I'm not going to talk about nations or any of the, the, the actual setting or the rules. So hopefully, if you're not interested in Empire, you'll find this talk completely agnostic. There are a lot of factors in immersion, as psychological factors, factors about players. I'm going to touch on those, but I'm not going to go into any detail about them. I'm really very interested today in talking about the visual side of immersion in LARP, around the costume, the sets, the props. How do we improve those and get a more immersive experience? And that's ultimately what I'm going to talk about. What do we mean by immersion? I did some extensive research. I looked on Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, it said, immersion, uh, under virtual reality, it said, immersion is the state of consciousness where an immersion's awareness of physical self is diminished or lost by being surrounded in an engrossing total environment, often artificial. That's kind of what we're trying to get to in LARP, I think. We're trying to create an engrossing environment, something that you can become lost in, that you can lose your sense of who you are. So I thought that was a pretty good definition. It's not the only one. People often talk about suspension of disbelief. And apparently that phrase was created by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Again, all research thanks to Wikipedia. Um, and he said, to procure for these shadows of imagination that willing suspension of disbelief for the moment which constitutes poetic faith. Considerably more evocative than uh, virtual reality's definition. What was Coleridge talking about? He was writing his poetry at a time when the educated elites had become much more sceptical about and rational about the society that they lived in. People didn't believe, educated people didn't believe in magic and goblins anymore. And Coleridge wanted to create poetry that brought alive these mystical elements. And so he needed his readers to suspend their disbelief. And that's where this phrase came from. But Coleridge uniquely, or, or his argument was that that was the responsibility of the author, of the writer. Later, we, we tend to think of suspension of disbelief as being the responsibility of the reader. But Coleridge was very clear that it was the job of the person creating the art to make it so compelling that people wanted to suspend their disbelief, that they were pulled into it. What are the problems with immersion in LRP? Well, the two that... Uh, I come across frequently. One is accessibility. Trying to create an engrossing total environment is expensive. If you want really attractive kit, you either spend a lot of hours making it or you spend a lot of money producing it. If you want fantastic sets, it costs money. So accessibility is a real issue. And people talk a lot about the need to not concentrate too much on immersion because we need to ensure that the hobby remains accessible. There's also issues around causing offence, and I'm going to touch on both of these issues later on, but when people start to say what costume is or is not acceptable, what costume creates immersion, what elements damage immersion, people get offended. They get really offended. So, can we do without it? Why do we need it? Why bother? LARP is not reenactment. I've heard that a hundred times over the last, the last ten years. It's frequently trotted out. And obviously it's a statement of the obvious, but what they're really saying implicitly is that it doesn't matter if it doesn't look that great. It doesn't matter if it's not right. The implicit kind of idea behind LARP is not reenactment is it doesn't have to be correct or authentic or look right. Role playing is all about using your imagination. And again, I get this undercurrent that somehow immersion is for poor role players. You should be able to ignore these elements. You should be able to ignore the Coke cans. You should be able to ignore the, the plastic tents. I, I get this mood sometimes when I talk to people that people who can't 
immerse when these elements are present are somehow poor role players. And what they're really trying to sort of get to with all of that is that they're really saying immersion is not needed. It doesn't make any difference to the game. We don't need beautiful costumes. We don't need good quality sets. None of that makes a difference. Because basically it's just a game of imagination. Now, traditionally at this point I would say something about how Everybody's experience of LARP is different and everybody's entitled to their own views and how it's okay and we should have a plurality of LRP and everybody should have their own LARP experience and be able to go to the events they want. And all of that is true, but about this specific idea that immersion is just not important, costumes and, and weapons and props don't matter, I think it's just rubbish. <laughs> it's just rubbish. Um, I don't believe a word of it. And that's quite a strong view, so I, I want to try and support that. I want to look at outside LARP for a minute. Who else values immersion? Look at cinema. They have an entire special <coughs> effects industry. I went to see Jurassic Park. It's a terrible movie, but it's great <laughs> up until the point where the actors open their mouths. <laughs> oh, that point, it's brilliant. I was spellbound watching the incredible special effects. I really felt like I was watching dinosaurs. They poured money to make that film as immersive as possible. Script supervisors are guys in cinema whose job it is to check continuity from one shot to the next. Films can be shot months apart, but the scenes are, are, are one after the other. So the guys have got to check every element of the continuity. And they're doing all of this to ensure that the film is as immersive as possible. They want to draw you in. Immersion is incredibly important in cinema. That's why they turn the lights off. You sit down... They turn the lights off. It's a tiny little touch. They want to block out all of that 20th century, all of that surrounding thing. They want to take you into their world. Theatres are just the same. Costumes and sets. Theatre groups spend a fortune trying to get the costumes and sets right. Yes, there are some theatre uh, methods where they do it without costume or it's all very stripped down. But they employ expensive lighting rigs to try and focus you onto the right moments in the, in the production all about trying to immerse you into the play. Both cinema and theatre ask you to turn off your mobile phone. We know why that is, because nobody wants the phone to go off during the performance and be dragged out of it. They want to stay immersed in what's happening. Computer games. The whole graphics card industry is insane. Thousands of pounds being spent, millions of pounds being spent developing ever more powerful graphics cards. Why do we want them? Because we want better graphics in our computer games, and we want better graphics for one reason and one reason only. It makes the game more immersive. Convincing storylines and cutscenes, they pay actors and film them and put them in the middle of your game. You can't even play this section of the game, you just sit there and watch it. The only reason they're doing that is to try and draw you into the storyline of the game, to make the game more immersive. Every element of these creative medias, of cinema, of theatre, of computer games, is trying to make the experience more immersive. That's why I'm saying that immersion is central to my role playing. It is a critical element of the whole experience, and it's fundamentally one of the most important things that we should be striving for. It provides a richer, more compelling experience, you frequently, when you talk to people about live role-playing events, or when they're bitching about the bad things that happen, they bitch about the people who dropped out of character, because they don't want people damaging their immersion. And what I'm really trying to argue is that improving immersion is the mainstream for our hobby. Yes, there will be people for whom this is not important. There will be people shaking their heads and going, I, I don't need immersion in my games. But there is a reason why cinema computer games are trying to get more immersion because fundamentally that's what the majority of people want. High immersion games are kind of a niche at the moment for British LARP but that's because they're difficult to deliver it's not because they're not what people want. Immersion is the mainstream. Now you may not be convinced at this point, maybe I, maybe I haven't sort of sold my point strongly enough so I'm going to do something a little unfair now and show some pictures. Um, I look at that and I think, wow, that looks fantastic. They look amazing. I have no idea what they're doing, but I want to go, I want to be in that game. <laughs> <laughs> you 
it's not fair, we're all laughing. Why are we laughing at this picture? We're laughing because there's costume standards and inevitably we know the level of immersion will be significantly lower in whatever these guys are doing. It's not that they haven't tried, it's just they're starting from a much lower baseline. I have no idea what this guy is playing. <laughs> I, I mean, 50 50, it's either a dog or a fish. But I <laughs> can you tell? Oh, oh, oh. Is it not a road? That's really, really harsh. If we accepted the idea that immersion didn't matter, if we accepted the idea that costumes were not important, we'd have to argue, we'd have to accept that the two people on either side were just as it had the same impact on our game as the dogfish in the middle. <laughs> um, and then, perfect, we managed to find this, this picture that gets most of the great costume crimes of our hobby. Uh, there's a guy over here wearing a leather trench coat. He's undoubtedly going to be counting that as armour. Um, the inevitable heavy metal t-shirt, the jeans, and my favourite touch is this chain. I don't know, again, I genuinely have no idea if that is part of his costume or is his regular streetwear? There's just no way to tell. Um, I, I, that, that's my, my, my kind of claim then. Immersion is important. You look at those pictures and you can just see. It, is, it creates a difference when you're playing these games to be able to interact with people with a good kit, with the good props. It makes a difference. So, conclusion. Improve immersion. Problem solved? Well, no. As we said, it's difficult, it's expensive, it's got accessibility issues, it causes offence. So if we want to do it, the real question is how? How are we going to do it? What creates immersion? Um, I had an interesting chat with some people on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> how do we get immersion? There's a lot of factors that create immersion. One of the most important is enthusiasm and passion. You've got to turn up and want to play the game. You've got to really feel enthusiastic and passionate for it. Um, it's one of the reasons often that people who are new to the hobby are actually immediately make great people to role play with because they've got that passion. The kind of cynical, jaded old hacks who've seen it all before, they're often not the most you know, enjoyable people, to, not as enjoyable as the newbies who've got that passion and the, and the enthusiasm for it. Confidence, I think, is really important, and it's a subtle element. You, to become immersed in the setting, you've got to feel confident that you know what you're doing. You've got to feel confident that you know who you are, and you know what your character should know. Without that confidence, it's hard to, to, to become immersed. We want compelling storylines, like Coleridge, that the, the story, the narrative, the events that happen, whether that's plot or player-driven, I don't care. It's got to draw people in. And we want an appealing visual diorama. We want to look at things, we want to look at kit and sets and think, wow, that looks ace. What damages immersion? Fundamentally, it's about intrusion. Intrusive rules. There are trade-offs there, and I'll come to them later, but rules with lots of calls, rules that are complex and you're trying to follow them. Any time where you're, you're thinking about the rules more than you're thinking about your character, you've got an element of, of, that's damaging your immersion. Out of character comments and actions, whether they are Monty Python references or simply people just dropping out of character, can damage your immersion. And then the critical one, visual elements that are out of place. I should probably have subtitled that Coke cans. <laughs> um, anything that, that breaks the, 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 the vision, the, the setting, that damages the continuity will damage your intrusion, will damage your immersion. So, we want better, uh, better immersion, so we should have less intrusive rules. Well, you've got to acknowledge that, that when, I think it's really important for game organisers who are creating games to acknowledge that rules damage immersion. And they should be thinking about that when they're creating the rules. But there is a trade-off. Rules also create structure. They allow things. You know, rules for magic allow magic to happen. Rules for combat allow combat to happen. There is a trade-off clearly here. I'm not going to talk too much about well, I'm not going to talk any more about rules because that could be a talk in itself. Better sites. Better sites would help immersion. We're really lucky at the moment. Wing Drumble, uh, Wood, Root and Branch Acres, they've opened up in the Midlands. Huntley Wood is coming. Uh, on stream, and that will be an amazing LRP site, absolutely astonishing. Um, and so we are getting better sites, but sites are an enormous
enormous logistical challenge. Finding a good site is like, it's the hardest part of running an event. So I think focusing on that is, is not the most effective way to improve inertia. The classic one I've seen is minimum standards. People, you know, ban trainers, ban jeans, ban t-shirts, problem solved. That will sort our immersion. Problems with that is painful to enforce. It's really difficult to go up to someone who's come to your LRP game for the very first time and say, sorry, you can't wear your, your trainers. It hasn't brought any other shoes. So you, you create a, a very um, unwelcoming environment. If you're, and it, 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 that's problematic. Uh, there's also, I dislike it because there's a relentless focus on the negative. I love this hobby, it's an amazing hobby. I don't want to go around to anybody talking to them about trainers, jeans and t-shirts. I want to talk about the cool in lot, not the bad bits. And I think that's really why I, I, I'm not that big on, on minimum standards, because I think we can remove the worst elements of, of immersion damaging costume, but that isn't going to raise the whole level of the game. It isn't going to raise costume all the way across the spectrum. And too often, the, the debate about immersion is pegged to this one issue of, well, there are people in jeans. Yes, getting rid of that pair of jeans would improve the immersion, but improving costume right the way across the game would improve the game for everybody. So my solution, change everything. <laughs> change the culture, change the players, change the traders, change the organisers. Let's change our attitudes, let's change the way we think about this, let's change our approach. The way to, to get higher immersion stand, uh, standards, the way to get more immersive events, if that's what we really want, is to change the way we approach them and the way we think about them. How does culture help? Is culture a big deal? I've started banging on about this a lot recently. Why is culture important? Um, it's really, culture dictates a lot of things. It dictates, dictates the assumptions that we make about what can be achieved and what can't be achieved. It dictates our attitudes about what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. It actually, in a very subtle way, underpins a huge amount of what we do in LARP. And I got that um, lesson very clearly. I went to a Danish event. Uh, it was a, a big war game over in Denmark. So I was invited over. And I went over because I was very interested to, to see other kinds of LARP. And if you look, there's me on the, on the right-hand side, uh, Colin Northridge, who went over with me. I'm carrying a nine-foot pike. It's got a wooden handle, a solid wooden handle, no protection of any kind. At the top is some pipe lagging, there's about a foot of pipe lagging, and then there's a little sort of squidgy foam spear head, um, and that was acceptable for, that was thrust safe. That nine foot wooden spear was classified as thrust safe for the game. 450 people were going to fight all day in a competitive LARP battle, and there was about 50 of them using nine foot wooden unprotected weapons. And you're like, wow, those Danes are crazy! They must be, they must not care a damn about safety. Well, except for the fact that they had no head hits in their battle system. They thought head hits were insane. They, when I said, oh, we have head hits in loads of our games, they looked at me like I was crazy. Not only do they have no head hits, but they have people going around going, where's your helmet? They expected everybody in the fight to be wearing a reenactment grade steel helmet to protect their head in a game with no head hits. The point I'm trying to make here is that their expectations, their assumptions, their values about what was safe and what was not safe, radically different to ours because their culture was different. And that actually, if you want to change the game you're playing, ultimately what you've got to change is the culture of the game. It's not about the rules, it's not about the setting. The most important thing is about the culture and the attitudes of the people playing it. That's all a bit kind of woolly. What, what does that mean? What does it translate to? What, 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 what's practical? Well, I, I subtitled my original speech, uh, Communication, Accessibility and Culture. And I was kind of trying to pull out what I thought was important things that could be done to try and make this transformation to enable us to have more and more sort of events. So organisers can communicate better. We should define our worlds better. We should take the time 
to create the setting and communicate the setting to players. We've got to show players what it looks like. You can't complain if somebody turns up in the wrong costume if you didn't tell them what the right costume was, if you didn't show them. Art, studio photos, movie stills, descriptions. There's lots of ways. You know, you can go and clip 20 film shots and put them up for your game. There's lots of ways to show players what the kit you want for the game, for the setting is. You know, it can all be done at different levels. T Ten years ago when we launched Maelstrom, we sent out a nice little glossy pack. And in it there was a CD with a film on it and a costume guide. And as the years went by, lots of LARP games made little trailers to, to launch their game. And sadly, not that many did costume guides. And I think the real lesson of, of, of Maelstrom is that actually what organisers should do is spend their time communicating the setting, the visuals, the aesthetics, tell players what you're trying to achieve. Because if you don't, they've got no chance of being able to create it for you. Talk to your players. Lots, and this is more of a problem with big event organisers, without a shadow of a doubt. But have a dialogue with your players. They should be able to get in touch with you and say, is this kit appropriate? Is this kit right? What about this? The more, the, the more dialogue that everyone in the community has about what kit will look good in the game, the better chance everyone has of turning up with good kit. <coughs> players, players need to communicate better. First of all, we need to be honest with ourselves. A lot of our kit often isn't very good. And if we don't accept that and start off with that, and I, I, I'm absolutely including myself in this, a lot of my kit is pretty bad. In fact, almost all of my kit is pretty basic. That doesn't mean we should beat ourselves up about it. We all started from pretty well. I certainly started with those photos we showed earlier with ten guys on a club linear, one of whom is in costume and the rest are in jeans and t-shirts. We've come a fantastic way. But if we're honest with ourselves about what we've achieved, we can be honest about what we want to achieve. We need to be realistic about what we can accomplish. There's no point players trying to create something that's beyond their own means. But that again comes back to this being honest with yourself. You, people need to be truthful about how good the kit they've made to themselves is. Without that, they won't be able to take on board criticism from other people. Question the compromises. Um, what am I saying here? When you make kit, it costs money. It costs time. You're going to compromise. You're not going to make kit that is perfect and movie quality. If you are, fantastic and great. But if you're that person, my talk's not really aimed at you. If you're a person like me who has to make compromises because money and time are not limited, this is really important. Think about the compromises you're making and ask for help. Question whether they're right ones. The first piece of armour I ever made for LRP was a suit of ring mail. I bought six metres of black leatherette at three pound a metre from a market stall and hand sewed 6,000 copper curtain rings to it. It looked okay. I spent three months making it. If I questioned the compromises, why am I using leatherette instead of using leather? Why am I using curtain rings instead of trying to source something that will look better? If I'd asked for help from the community and said, where do I find leather? Where can these things be had? I would have made better choices and I would have made better costume. The most important and the most difficult is that we need to be receptive to criticism. Criticism of costume is really hard. For most of us, our image, of, our, our sense of self-worth is tied up with our self-image. We don't want anyone to come along and tell us, your kit looks rubbish, your kit looks rubbish. It is an insult. We, we need, as a community, to be better at critiquing costume and critiquing props. But we also need to try and be more receptive to it. When somebody's trying to genuinely help you make a better costume, we need to learn to listen to them. The problem with criticism, and this I think is really important, um, I, I was privy uh, about 10 days ago to a spectacular incident of internet bullying. I watched one player rip another player a new arsehole, I'm sorry for being crude, but over the internet they laid into this player and told them in no uncertain terms that their costume was bang out of order. For Empire, a game we have not yet released any costume. <laughs> um, okay. Um, 
I'm going to make a, a very strong statement now. If you're criticising someone's costume on the internet, you're doing it wrong. You cannot help somebody get better costume over the internet. Just don't even try. It won't help. You will just offend them and irritate them and they will become defensive. The time to help somebody get better kit is in person when they're your friend. It is not over the internet with a stranger. Just don't even try it. It won't help. Personal attacks. How do we judge good kit? I've talked about this issue a couple of times over the years recently. The problem with trying to help people get better kit is you get this very defensive. Well, who are you to judge? Who says what is better kit? Who says what is worse kit? Well, I think we saw earlier that you can have good kit and you can have bad kit. So clearly there is some metric. How do we define it? How do we get this quality of authenticity in law? And I've coined this word a couple of years back, cool authentic. This idea that the costume should look cool, but it should be authentic to the setting. I've also heard people recently say, we don't like that word, Matt, you made it up, so we're going to call it re <laughs> <laughs> um, I've also heard the rule of cool. It should look cool. The costume should look cool for the setting. I don't care what the word is. There's a setting that, that the organisers, because we've already talked about, have communicated really clearly to their players what that setting is. Your costume should look cool for that setting. Now, does it have to be the greatest costume on the field? No. You, well, nobody expects us overnight to turn into the extras from Lord of the Rings, but it should be as cool as we can make it. That, that's, that's what we're asking. Accessibility. This is really important. We need to make it easier for people to make the costume. Years ago, there were links and guides on how to create costume on the internet, and they're still there, and people are still adding to them, but they're not getting any more organised, and organisers are not taking the time to point players at the relevant costume guides. Um, you know, organisers need to help players create the costume. We, we should have more links on where to buy the materials. Wikis should be a great help. The technology should be there for us to create all this. And somehow, the, the, the community is so fragmented that there are no central resources where we can go to, and organisers are not creating them for their games to describe how to make the kit. If we want people to be able to make better kit, if we want to help them, we need to make it more accessible. We need to help players understand their costume. And I've, I've talk, got Wan and Trini and Susanna. Why are they up there? They have these dreadful television programmes where they go into people's homes and, and sort of help them with their wardrobe. That exists as prime time television because people understand that looking good in costume is really hard. It's a skill that most of us, again I want to stress I include myself, don't actually have. It's hard to put costume together. It's hard. Yes, you can go and buy a piece of nice costume from a trader, but to bring the right elements of costume together, that takes a real understanding. It takes an appreciation of what makes good costume. And some people have really got that skill. The Gok Wans and the Trini and Susannas of the LARP world have really got that skill. People like me might as well be blind. It just it, It's a closed book to me. But it doesn't have to be. We talked earlier about asking friends for help. You know, people talk about the cost of having good kit, and the cost is a serious problem. You know, many of us have not got much money, but good costume advice is priceless. Those people who've got those skills and can give you advice about what to put together with what, they'll do that for free, and they can help you put a kit together that's better than the kit you would manage by yourself, and doesn't have to cost money. Help players to buy costume. We should, organisers should have links on their websites of where to go to get the costume that suits the game. Traders should stock their stalls so that the stock that is relevant to the game is at the front and clearly labelled. Why would they do that? They're just here to make a, a, a business. Well, if uh, me as a player, and again I go back to this, that often poor understanding of what's appropriate for a game. If I go into a trader store and I can see that this stock over here is right for the game, it gives me the confidence to buy the kit. I went to Dumnoni Chronicles uh, a few weeks back. For those who don't know it, it's a very high immersion game. It's probably got a reputation of having one of the highest immersion standards in Britain currently being run. It's very dark ages, it's very authentic, it's very low fantasy. Strong emphasis on having the right kit for the setting. One of the traders had an enormous sword that was 
maybe four or five foot long, and covered in flames and chaos spiky bits. 200 pounds, this sword. In the right high fantasy game, it would have been perfect. I was sat with a new player at that game, or he was actually a new crew member, and he said, I'm going to come to the next event and I'm going to buy that sword and use it. He genuinely thought this chaos spiky death sword would be the perfect weapon for an Iron Ages uh, low fantasy game. And he thought that because he, he wasn't that versed, he didn't understand, he didn't appreciate, we're not giving people any help. So, we need a better culture for LARP. It needs to be cooperative, it needs to be supportive, it needs to be ambitious. Role playing is a cooperative hobby. We all role play together and it, it's that interaction between us that gives us the enjoyable, that the fun. You can't role play by yourself in a field for a weekend. I, I challenge anyone. It just can't be done. What I'm saying here is that your immersion is my problem. That the more effort I put into my kit and my uh, costume and my props and everything I do, my characterization, my role playing, the better an event everyone else will have. What we need is an attitude in the whole. If we want higher immersion events, we need to accept that the immersion, everybody else's immersion, is my responsibility. No more saying, well, that's up to you to suspend your disbelief. If you can't hack my coke cans, that's your problem. It, we, we all need to try and embrace this idea that we're all trying to create a better event together. I used to talk about this idea for the big fest games that you could turn up and be this lone PC in a field of hundreds of NPCs. You could treat the other players like they were NPCs. And that seemed like a real insight ten years ago. These days, I, I'm just starting to say the opposite. Wouldn't it be great if we went to an LRP event and we took the attitude that we were the only NPC in the field that everyone else was a player. Why would that help? Because as an NPC, you, you want to give everybody else an enjoyable time. You want them to have an enjoyable event. You want them to have a more enjoyable experience. Imagine if the seven, eight hundred people at the event all had the same attitude towards your character. That, that would be a better attitude than people turning up going, well, your game is not my problem. It's your, it's your responsibility to enjoy this. It's everyone. Role playing's cop. We've got to work together. It's got to be supportive. Role playing is a social hobby. The most common argument against immersion is that it leads to personal attacks, it offends people, it leads to disdain for the club systems, it, it becomes this elitist thing in which people with good kits sneer at people who don't have good kits, where people are made to feel inferior or unacceptable. It doesn't have to be like that. It, it, why, why is, it, why is, it, why is the, the debate polarised in that way? We should all want to help each other improve our kit. If you've got the best kit in the world, but I've got an idea that will help, why aren't I, why aren't I telling you? Everybody should work together and be supportive of each other. Help the organisers to improve their costume. A lot of organisers try and run an event by themselves. And certainly PD have been guilty of this for years. We try and put an event on and go, you, you players, you just turn up and enjoy it. Uh, you can't get involved, you can't help. The event is everybody's event. It's everybody's responsibility. We all need to work together to produce a better event. So let's help the organisers to improve their, their sets, their costumes. But the most important thing is a social hobby. Sneering isn't helping. If you're going to someone and saying, mate, your costume's rubbish, that's not helping. That is just, all you're doing is being offensive and rude. You're diminishing the hobby, you're driving people out of the hobby, you're making it a bitter and unpleasant place to role play. Sneering helps nobody. That's not what I'm calling for. Praise is easier and more effective than criticism. Pointing out good kit and, hey, that's really great kit. Going up to people and complimenting them on their kit is much more effective. If we have a community that is seen to encourage good kit, that will be more effective than pointing out the people who are sneering. So I'm going to go back to this picture because before I sneered at this picture, and we invited us all to laugh at some of the poor kit costume. But you know, I don't know how well you can see it, but there are a couple of people in this picture who've got good costume. 
Though two, the two archers have got really nice wooden bows. They're not cheap fiberglass nasty bows. They're really nice wooden bows. The archer girl's got a nice tunic. She's got uh, in-character leggings on. And you probably can't see it, but she's got icy footwear on. One of the single hardest pieces to get right in LARP. Now, if I wanted to be constructive instead of sneering, if she came to me and said, how can I get better kit? I would say, again, you can't see it well, but take your knife out of your belt. The best way that that girl could improve her kit would be to get a nice tooled leather scabbard to put her, her dagger in. She's the best kit in the field. She's clearly, of all the people in that group, got the best kit. But she can improve her kit just like everyone else can. And what I'm, what I'm trying to say is, she's got great kit, but we can be constructive. And if we're receptive and we want to get a better immersion for everybody, then we should all be looking to improve our kit. The most important thing, if we're going to get more immersive events, is to be ambitious. Role play is a hobby for dreamers. It's not a hobby for accountants and safety engineers. It's about dragons and magic. It's about amazing things that we can imagine. And it's about trying to make those things real. We should be ambitious about what can be achieved. And so there's two really important things that... I think a community that wants more immersive events needs to embrace. One is that every detail matters. The Coke cans matter. They're not the most important element, and fixating on tiny little elements doesn't help. But we sh what shouldn't be acceptable is for people to say, that doesn't matter. You should be able to ignore it. You should be able to we should all agree, if we want more immersive events, that all these elements are important. And critically, what I really want to sell is this idea of continuous improvement. A lot of us, and I'm guilty of this, go to an event, we get our kit for the event, we enjoy the event, go, oh, that's great, I can carry on playing now, I've got my kit, it's all sorted. And we go to the event again and again and again, with the same costume, doing the same thing that we've always done. What we need is a culture where, on the preparation for every event you go to, you spend some hours thinking, what can I do to make my kit better for this event? What one element would improve my kit? If the whole community had really bought into this idea of continuous improvement, if we knew that everybody was really sold on the idea of improving their kit from one event to the next, we wouldn't need to go around and sneer at the trainers or backbite at someone about their coke can or pick on someone because we know that that person had accepted that that detail was important and was committed when it, when it was possible financially and time-wise to improving their kit. And actually, these things will do more to get a community that wants more immersive events and is able to produce more immersive events than just banning T-shirts and jeans. Why? Why, why? why is all of this important, Matt? It's just a game. It's just, it's just a bit of fun. It's not important. What am I getting so head up about? This is Bicoline in Quebec in Canada. They have 500 acres for their dedicated live role-playing site. These two buildings that you can see, these two purpose-built period buildings, are two of about 50 on the site. They have an entire site of this, and they run battles and all sorts of things there. I want that. I want that. That's what I want. I want my lot to be cooler than that. <laughs> Game of Thrones! Everyone loves Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones is amazing, it's brilliant, it's fantastic. I love this picture. Tyrion Lannister, he's got to be the coolest character in it. But look at his kit, look at the set, look at the shot. I want to be stood there. I want to be in that, I want to be in that film, I want to be in that moment. I want to be immersed to that level. I want a setting that pulls me. I want that level of visual appeal. Next year, we're going to launch a new game, Empire. Um, we're spending a lot of money on Empire because, like I said, organisers have got to change their game too. It's really important. I, I really want to create something that, that is immersive. The setting's very simple. It's players versus barbarian orcs in great big battles. There's lots to it, the complexity of plot. What do I want it to look like? I want it to look like this. <laughs> I don't want 400 orcs in a tabard and a bit of green space. <coughs> I want it to look spellbinding. I want it to look amazing. I want it to draw people in. For that to happen, we've all got to get involved and to make it happen. Bill Shankly said, 
Some people believe football is a matter of life and death. I'm very disappointed with that attitude. I can assure you it is much more important than that. It's a very famous quote. The point is that we must remember that LARP is a game. It, it, you know, it's done for fun, it's done for enjoyment. But that doesn't mean we can't be passionate about it. That doesn't mean we can't be every bit as serious about it as Premier League football teams and Premier League football fans. I want us, you know, I want that level of passion and emotion. I want us to, to be that ambitious. If we want our games to be awesome, we must be awesome to our games. If you want an immersive game, if we want it as a community, then we've got to adapt a culture that will create it. Thank you. Any questions? So. <laughs> yes, excellent. Have you thought of something like a Rate My Kit website then? Or uh, a forum to say, is this kit suitable? I think I rate my kit website. Yeah, a random, a random oh. picture of someone's kit comes up and you give it a rating 1 to 10. I, 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 yeah. 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 As I said earlier, I think critiquing someone's kit over the internet is a recipe for disaster. <laughs> um, they will only get offended. With all the best will in the world, you cannot help people improve their kit over the internet. Not in the specific. I think there is real value in trying to create some kind of internet-based mechanism where we can look at kit before people have bought it and put it on and give advice and help, but it is really difficult. If you want examples of good kit, then have a kit of the month, kit of the event. I, I, I think there are lots of interesting questions about... Don't be a star. Sorry? Don't be a star. You're just going to put together a bit of kit. Let's have player suggestions on what you do to make it better. Yeah. That way it takes it away from being an attack on a player. It's a, uh... Yeah, no, I think that's a fantastic idea. Mm -hmm. We could get kit off traders, we could put it on a model, we could photograph it, put it on the internet, and then get people to suggest ways to make it better. Because like you say, we, what we've got to do is when we're critiquing and improving, we've got to remove the personal element. You can't critique someone's kit, some, a person's kit on the internet, but we can critique kit. And if we're careful, I think that's a fantastic idea. Are you going to be putting more focus on kit hire, that people can turn up to the event and hire something that you've provided? We are not. Um, I've looked at kit hire many, many times, and it's really quite problematic. I think if PD's keen to have a more immersive game, we've got to be much more public about the fact that you can come behind scenes and borrow kit. Uh, you know, you can borrow, if your character gets killed, you can borrow a spare kit. If you come without your kit, you can borrow a kit. Or if it's a new character and you need some help just getting the costume together. PD has always tried everything possible to help. I, the, the financial side of renting is just a nightmare. And, and there's no reward in it for the business. We'd lose more money than we made because the kit would walk. Whereas if you, if you lend someone, then they're actually more inclined to, they feel like they've had a favour and they're more inclined to bring it back in good condition. Perversely, um, so I think you're right. We need to be much more um, supportive in terms of providing kit. Uh, and again, if you look at Dunnoni Chronicles, which has had a long experience of trying to be more immersive, that's been a big part of what they do of providing kit to new players. The first time I turned up to Dunnoni, I had to borrow kit off them, and they were really good at just sort of taking down one set of kit and going like, "Here we go, we can sort of sort out another step for the Yeah. Go on. We'll, we'll try and get. I was going to say, uh, the third and final kick challenge thing, Love Odyssey, um, would you sort of encourage uh, other organisers to do it and also for anyone? Because I think personally that was an incredibly good resource for particularly students who are going to want to come to games as well. We, we need to keep the game as accessible as possible. I, and I think it's really important that, that we don't turn the debate about wanting a more immersive hobby into some sort of elitist thing of if you've not got 500 pounds of kit you can't come. That would be a disaster. No one wants that. The 30 pound kit challenge was primarily the work of two people, Jude Reed and Daisy Abbott. They did an astonishing job. Uh, it takes a spe specific set of skills to do what they did. Every organiser who's got access to a Jude Reed or a Daisy Abbott should be doing that. Uh, that, that is gold dust. You know, that, and, 
you can't underestimate how important that kind of resource is. Yes, we're going to be doing that for Empire, uh, and yes, I think all organisers should look at it. If they want more immersive games, that's the kind of resource they should be giving their players. Um, connected with that, actually, because you were talking about the game kind of organised and kit-making guys actually wants to get organised. I mean, would it be worth trying to set up some sort of site which is categorised by a particular LARP setting and stuff, and you've got kids advice on that, and people post up guides like Daisy and Jude have done, on a sort of centralised sort of database kind of thing? I, I think so. I, I'd like to see the community be a little bit more cooperative and a little bit less factionalised about costume advice. It seems like there are a million LRP websites about costume, and each one's got a small, tiny handful of resources. When I started out, you went to Aldebaran, run by Mike Horrell, and it had everything you needed on. But I'm just showing my age there. That doesn't exist anymore. And it doesn't feel like the hobby's moved on. Instead of sort of migrating to one great wiki to rule them all, we've just ended up with scattered resources everywhere. I'm not sure it's something that any one organiser needs to do, other than if they're doing it for their game. But I think if there's a community developing that wants more immersive games, then creating some central resources around producing and accessing and creating and buying better kit makes tremendous sense. Sorry, Phil's Sorry, first. I was going to ask about the kit. Okay. <laughs> Yes, um, in, in character. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want it simple, huh? Um, we are, we, as PD, we're very actively looking uh, to change our whole culture of how we run LARP uh, and, and what we do. And one of the things we're very keen to do for Empire is to create what we call community days, where people come down and get involved, and they help us make the game better. They make bits of set dressing and stuff. But also, I think... That there's an opportunity there to share skills and allow them to, to produce stuff as well. That gives you a forum then to say, yes. this is how you make this better, not just you can leave that Yes. I think perversely, there's, a, there's almost, um, I think for small clubs, a lot of small clubs do this now, they have kit making days, and those are fantastic. A lot of the large events and, and the, the large event organisers have just never gone into it. They've regarded it as someone else's problem. And that's crazy, you know. Fundamentally, I want to produce a compelling LARP game, and for that to happen, I need a load of players to turn up with great kit. I'm absolutely dependent on the players to make the game work. So it makes clear sense to do everything possible to help them have great kit. And, and you know, having kit and, and trying to organise that, facilitate that, makes sense. So you're communicating the ideas of the players in Empire. You're going to have the players monitoring for you. Are you going to communicate the idea of what you want them to dress up as NPCs for you? Yes, we are. We absolutely are. Um, I think our NPC will be quite a different model to the one that people are, are kind of used to. Because the, and, and it, we're, we're quite lucky. The nature of the setting means that you know you're in a war with the barbarian orcs. So we could put pictures of the barbarian orcs up. We could put the brief for the barbarian orcs up of what their role playing is and what their characteristics and their personalities. It doesn't matter. You're not spoiling the plot. Everybody knew there was going to be a war with those barbarian orcs already. When people come to volunteer... They're already, they, you know, some of them have already read that material. And people have openly talked about making their own kit to come and play the Monsters Empire. We cannot possibly make that an expectation. That would be ridiculous and insulting. But it's the sort of enthusiasm that we need to produce a really immersive event. And, you know, I'm really looking forward to a group of guys rocking up to Monster with amazing orc kit. And, and they'll have a fantastic time as well, you know. It, LARP feeds off its own enthusiasm. The more you put in, the more you get out. Any other questions? Um, in, in, in that regard, um, I know you've even looked at other models of games. Do you think the UK will ever come to the stage of something like New Ideas and PC Monster Camps in, in that sense of having people who come as monster balls but who have a full weekend experience? Um, I've no idea. Um, absolutely no idea. Will it happen in this country? It, I think it'll happen if somebody decides it's a good idea and makes it happen. It clearly works for them over in Germany. Although, having said that, I haven't had a chance to get over there and actually see it working. Accounts of things working are always more impressive than actually seeing them working. Um, 
it's interesting and we're actively looking at it. You know, one of our people involved in the design, uh, Rick Wynn, who's been over to Germany a lot, he's really passionate about this idea that we could give people an alternative experience to playing the Imperials. And we say, yep, you're in a camp over there all weekend playing these crazy barbarian orcs. I, I think there's a lot of questions about how you'd make that enjoyable and how you'd make it fun. Um, I, I don't think it's ever likely to become the de facto model. I think that's if that's what you know. Will it ever happen? I just don't know. But I, I think I, I really I'm a big supporter of plurality. The more games we've got, the more you know. And I want let, let's be clear. I want high immersion games. I'm not saying low immersion games are bad. I'm not saying games that focus and make priorities of other things are bad. I just want a wider variety of games. And I personally want to play and run the high immersion kind of games. So I, I think it'd be great if someone tried that in this country. If you're excited about the idea of high immersion, you're excited about the, 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 the passion that that brings to the, like, the role playing experience, how it enriches it, and you kind of want that for everyone who's a participant. Maybe not for the refs and the admin staff, but I want my NPCs to feel like immersed. I want my monsters to feel immersed. I've talked to people about how important it will be at Empire to make the monstering experience as immersive and deep as possible. The thing that interests me about the German model is this idea that you could have hundreds of crew monstering and be immersed in their role of that monster all weekend so that they're role playing and experiencing it and again making that when, when the players encounter them it becomes a richer experience. The idea that the, 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 the solution is for them to have a, a camp of people who are not immersed and are just having a few tinnies with their mates I think is not a concept that dovetails into the idea of high emotion mark. You're not looking to then also have a camp of people who can't be arsed. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't see any value in it. I, I think I'm over time, but I'm just going to keep talking until I get thrown off. So. <laughs> <laughs> With system lethality? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, there's no doubt a conflict between your character getting killed and having to replace your kit. Um, it's, it's just one of the compromises. It's really, really important when we talk about them. Those of us who are advocates for high immersion art accept that there are compromises. Money is limited. People can't replace their costume easily. Um, I, I think... It's just a trade-off. I'm not personally keen on games where 30% of the characters are dead by Friday night. I don't think it creates a lot of continuity for the role-playing, and I think it does make it raises questions about costumes and about how we keep the standards up. I think the one thing that's interesting, and ironically I think PvP has been really unhelpful here, is that there's a perception that if your character dies you should change all your costumes. But somehow, unless you change your character and your icy friends and your costume, you're doing it wrong. Um, and that comes out of a PvP mindset that says the point of playing the game is to kill all your icy enemies. So if you respawn as another member of your group, then you've really sort of cheated in some way. And I think we should actually just back off and go, look, 90% of games, if you reuse your kit, it's not the end of the world, you know, we decide, sure if you've got the money to change the kit, great, but we should just get a bit less anal about recycling kit, and I think that would help. Last question, then. Yeah. Uh, on a similar vein, I was wondering how you thought this factors in for uh, short run campaigns, I say short run, month, systems that end versus the ongoing things like LT. Yeah, uh, it's very interesting. The picture I showed you earlier of the Danish LARP, I don't know if any of you looked at it, but the costume standards there were really high. Um, I think that picture of the halberd ears is actually taken from that Danish LARP game. Um, but this year, that Danish group chose to change their setting completely. 
And instead of doing it in the Warhammer world, they decided to do Crusaders versus Vikings. And the entire player base had to get a new kit for the game. For a one-off game that was a battle weekend with not that much role playing in it. And yet everybody kind of sucked it up and went and got the kit and made new kit or brought us the kit together as best they could. I think if you're excited about the values of high immersion art, you're excited about it and you want to do it to the best of your ability. You want to, to, to get the best kit you can. Clearly, a game that's going to play for 10 years, you might spend more money and more time. But if we accept that idea of continuous improvement, there's no absolute standard in high immersion art. There's no, this is great, this is good enough, you can go. What I want to push is this idea that we're all trying from one event to the next to improve our kit. And I think at that point, if you're going to a one-off event, you produce some kit. If the event runs again, you make it a bit better. If the event runs four times a year, you've got four opportunities a year to improve your kit. I think that's a better attitude than saying every event you go to, you should spend at least £200 on your costume. Because that's crazy, you know. So I don't actually think there's a conflict. Right, if anyone has any more questions for Matt, because we are just over time now, then obviously Matt's going to be downstairs in the PD store. We've also got a member of the design, Empire Design team who's hiding over there, who will be around. Um, so if you have any Empire-specific questions, then we are willing to answer them, but downstairs on the yeah. store. Okay. All, all Empire-specific questions downstairs. Thank you very Thank much. You.